you have joined us for the nexus of substance misuse prevention and problem gambling prevention. So hold on, we'll get started in just a minute. And good morning. We're at 10.01 and we're going to go ahead and get started. <clears throat> you have joined the Nexus of Substance Misuse Prevention and Problem Gambling Prevention uh, presented by Rebecca Bishop. This presentation is brought to you and prepared for the Great Lakes PTTC under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA. The opinions expressed in this webinar are the views of the speakers and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services, or SAMHSA. The PTTC believes that words matter and we use affirming language in all activities. A few housekeeping items. Um, if you have technical issues, and uh, please, if you're having uh, problems, individually uh, message Rebecca Buller, me, or Jen Winslow in the chat section at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be happy to assist you. Questions for the speaker um, can be put in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen, and we will help get those to our presenter. You'll be directed to a link um, after the event, and it's a short survey and we'd really appreciate it if you could fill it out. It takes about three minutes and it helps us to continue to provide high quality, low cost or no cost training opportunities. And finally, certificates of attendance um, will be sent out via email to all those who attend this, the full session. And it can take up to two weeks to receive those certificates. Just a quick reminder, if you don't see it in two weeks, double check your spam or um, trash folder just in case. Um, sometimes they go there. And if you'd like to know more about what we're doing or information on upcoming events, please see our social media pages. And now I want to introduce our presenter, Rebecca Bishop. Rebecca specializes in initiatives to improve uh, the health, mental health, and well being of youth and high risk populations. She brings expertise in mental health promotion, health equity, cultural and linguistic responsiveness, community mobilization and violence prevention and intervention. Bishop has a history of applying a health and racial equity lens to substance use, youth development, violence and problem gambling prevention as well as mental health issues. She leads EDC's Gambling Prevention Technical Assistance Center and has managed three regional planning processes across Massachusetts to learn about local knowledge, beliefs, and attitudes related to gambling, resulting in population-specific prevention strategies. The Bishop holds a master's in social work, health, and mental health administration from Boston College Graduate School of Social Work and has a certificate in nonprofit management and leadership. I wanna turn things over to Rebecca and say thank you for being here and uh, go ahead and you are in charge. Thank you, Rebecca. Bear with me here while I get the PowerPoint up and running. Perfect. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with you. As was already said, this is the nexus of substance misuse and problem gambling. In today's webinar, we are going to accomplish the following objectives. We're going to discuss this complex relationship between problem gambling and substance misuse. Um, we're gonna look at the characteristics that uh, uh, highlight this relationship. 
We're going to look at challenges uh, to addressing both of these issues. Um, this includes exploring shared risk and protective factors. We know that's essential to prevention. Then we're going to look at collaboration, barriers to collaboration, as well as collaboration strategies for uh, both this ne nexus as well as these fields to move forward uh, to address this nexus. Let's start with looking at these two issues separately before we jump into this nexus. We think about substance misuse. Approximately 59% of the population has participated in substance misuse in the last month. And nearly one in seven young adults uh, has had a substance misuse disorder. If we look comparatively, uh, when we look at problem gambling, only about 3% of the US population engages in problem gambling or has experienced problem gambling. And nearly one in 10 young people has problems or developed problems related to gambling. As we see, substance misuse is far more uh, known as an issue, but also prevalent across the country. And when we think about problem gambling, uh, it's only been, it's only 3% of the population has this issue, partly because it's a new issue, but also there's lots of efforts happening across the country that we'll get into to strengthen the systems. Well, why do we care about this nexus and why do we care about these two issues? We know this for substance misuse, but many of these things are also true for problem gambling. Uh, the youth brain we know is not fully developed until 25. So gambling can be dangerous for youth, just like gambling can be dangerous, uh, just like substance misuse can be dangerous for youth. Youth who gamble early are for, far more likely to develop problem gambling later in life. We know this is also very similar for substance misuse, right? Um, there's an article uh, actually uh, from a study that happened with uh, exploring the impact that gambling has on the human brain. And the way they described it is the brains of people anticipating a win at the roulette table or any gambling for that matter is much like those taking euphoria inducing drugs. So again, right? Gambling does have a direct impact on the brain, just like we know substance misuse does. So when we think about youth, this is really an important nexus for them, right? And it's important nexus for prevention that we wanna um, consider. When we think about, uh, we know parental perceptions are really important to prevention, right? And the same goes for this nexus. In this particular study of uh, parental perceptions of serious youth issues, you see here that there's a very high uh, perception of harm for drug use, for alcohol use, for drinking and driving, all public health issues that are well known um, and there's been lots of work on them. However, when you take a look at gambling, you see the parental perceptions are not as, right? The perception of harm uh, is extremely low, 40%. Gambling was the lowest issue, um, meaning parents didn't think it was that serious, right? Part of this is the reflection of um, that gambling is very much part of our society, right? There's many people that I talk to in my work at the Center of Excellence on Problem Gambling Prevention that doesn't even understand why gambling is a problem. The question is often, what is this gambling thing? Why is it even a problem, right? Um, and we know that when parents don't see something as a problem, we know that they don't, you know, talk to their, talk to young people about it, right? There's not honest conversations. There's not warnings about this. And the reality is, right? Parents should see this just like they see any other risk behaviors. Um, here's another study, a graph from another study that actually named risky behaviors, right? And once again, you see a similar trend. 
you see, um, and you know, also note this is both parents and teachers, right? So we talk about who has influence on young people. Both teachers, just like parents, um, identify drug use as a really risk as a risky behavior, right? Violence and bullying, um, alcohol use, even excessive video gaming. Both parents and teachers saw as a risky behavior. However, right, once again, gambling is ranked the lowest, right? Both among teachers and parents, lower among teachers, which is really interesting because there's a lot of gambling happening in schools. Um, actually, last year, I actually trained a group of resource officers who operate in schools because they're seeing kids on their phones gambling. Um, they're seeing more um you know uh, uh, f uh you know fights or disagreements about gambling in schools um so you know essentially uh, so this is something we want to address uh in this nexus uh and the other thing i would say is any other issues connected to low perception of harm we should also look at right there might not be studies we might not have data but this is clearly a challenge. And we know when perception, when there's a low perception of harm, we know that use or the activity is um, significantly increases. Here is a little bit more data when we kind of, as we carve out this nexus and kind of think about it. Um, this is data that looks at the percent uh, or uh, this looks at youth addictive behaviors by grade, right? And so we have alcohol, drugs, cigarettes by grade. We have both total use as well as weekly use. And very similar to, to the trends in the other graphs, we see that gambling is being used at the highest rates, right? higher than alcohol, higher than drugs, cigarettes, and gambling. Um, it's interesting, um, you know, when I talk to people, when you talk about perceptions, right, and, and especially when people aren't educated about this nexus, hands down, if you ask people, people think these numbers are flipped, right? They, they, they don't think that uh, gambling is happening, right, at such high rates, especially among this grade. So if we think about seventh grade, um, it's a transition year. Um, also note that alcohol is also higher than drugs for both total use and weekly use, right? The rates of alcohol are higher than drugs. Um, this is really a call for parents and a call for all adults in young people's lives to not just say, to not just talk about this as an important issue, but to also question how are young people gambling? What are their thoughts and perceptions about this issue? Um, and begin to address it just like substance misuse. Um, why is this nexus important? We know that uh, there are populations, and we're going to get into more populations. I know we talked about youth, but we're going to get into more populations. These populations are impacted at, at uh, and are at significant risk when you consider various dimensions of intersectionality, right? Just as an example, we just talked about youth. If youth are at risk for alcohol, tobacco, cigarettes, <laughs> other drugs, there are... they and they're at risk for gambling. If we just look at that alone, that's a lot of intersectionality, right? And really elevates the level of risk for youth. Um, this nexus is not comprehensively being addressed around the country. Um, we certainly at our center, certainly at Education Development Center, have connected with more and more states that are interested in addressing problem gambling along with substance misuse. But there are also many states that are not even thinking about addressing these issues. Um, problem gambling can often be politically connected uh, to thoughts and beliefs about the issue at the state level, right? And so 
if it's a state that is not interested in bringing gambling to their state, it might not even be an issue that they're willing to address, right? Um, there are populations impacted that are not being served. One of the things we're doing in Massachusetts is we are specifically working with local communities um, and we're specifically focusing on prevention. Both of those things, when you look at certainly the field of problem gambling, um, both of those things um, have very little capacity. So to my knowledge, we are, the, Massachusetts is the only state working with local communities on this issue. Um, and so if we think about the many other states, right, that have local communities that may have this need, they're really not being addressed. Um, and that's just really one small example. There's many, many examples of that. Um, addiction is a significant health problem um, and it's being partially addressed. The reality is we looked at brain development with problem gambling. The reality is, is that the same uh, public health supports that we have for substance misuse it's gonna be really important to think about them for problem gambling, right? Because these two issues are so closely connected, um, addiction is addiction, right? Um, I'll also just give one more example. In Massachusetts, we work with, um, one of the populations are people who are in recovery from substance misuse. And we work with them to try to delay or prevent an addiction to problem gambling, right? And so if we only address one and not the other, again, it highlights populations that uh, get left out and don't get uh, the services they need. And then finally, um, I, I can like wave a flag of the whole uh, webinar, but there's a huge need for prevention for both this nexus as well as problem gambling. Um, it's going to be important to so so this nexus feels new right because not a whole not a lot of people know about it not a lot of people are addressing it but the good thing is we know prevention right and especially in the substance misuse prevention world there's lots of prevention science to pull from right also the public health field right and so we want to pull those best practices that we know and we want to apply it to both this nexus as well as new new public health issues like problem gambling rebecca yes you, we do have a question and it was about one of the tables you showed recently um we have another rebecca <laughs> who asked in the table with the grade level use um depiction does cigarette category include vaping do you know if this if those included vaping i do not know if they included vaping um this data is from it's about 10 years old so it i i doubt it but i don't know for sure it's a really good question really good question especially right. with vaping rates so high are there any other questions? All right, perfect. Thank you for that. All right. So um, let's move on to definitions and make sure that we're all on the same page with language. Sometimes this can get confusing. Um, we'll start with problem gambling. So the term problem gambling really is describing any behavior that compromises, disrupts, or damages personal, family, or, voc or vocational pursuits, right? Um, essentially negative consequences, right? If there's any gambling that um, results in negative consequences in anyone's life, it's problem gambling. Um, I'll just compare that for a second to substance misuse, right? Um, very similar definition, right? Excessive alcohol or drug use that is used or in an unintended way that results in negative impacts in a person's lives, right? Um, for the most part, um, this is, and I'm speaking very broadly here, this is, right, um, uh, when somebody has developed a problem, right? Or they're on their way to developing a problem. 
Um, now, once someone has actually developed the problem, that's when we refer to it as a gambling disorder, right? Or a substance misuse disorder. And the characteristic we know of a disorder is it's diagnosable in the DSM-5. Um, there is a category for gambling as well as substance misuse. It is important to note that the categories in the DSM-5, these are connected. So the gambling uh, kind of grouping of symptoms were developed after or kind of mimicked after the substance misuse ones. Um, again, I think this really illustrates the connection between these two issues. Um, uh, so let's just remember this moving forward. Um, but this is language that we need to know as we kind of continue looking at this issue. Um, more language. And I'm going to focus on gambling because gambling is likely the new topic for folks on this webinar. Um, this is called, again, gambling continuum. And here's what's different about between problem gambling and substance misuse. So in the problem gambling world, um, just because you gamble doesn't mean that you have a problem, right? Whereas with substance misuse, once someone experiences substance misuse, um, it's obviously not, they, they don't necessarily have a problem, but substance misuse in itself is an indicator. It is not necessarily the case in gambling. So the gambling continuum starts with no gambling, right? There are many people that don't gamble. There's lots of reasons why they don't gamble. Um, and then there are recreational gamblers. Recreational gamblers are people who gamble for fun. Um, this really is the large majority of the population, right? Very similar to alcohol and drugs. Many people who misuse substances do not develop a problem. It's very similar for gambling. Many people who recreational gamble uh, do that do so without negative consequences. Once you move on to at-risk gamblers, this is where people may begin to start experiencing consequences. So at-risk uh, uh, gamblers are people who are either at elevated risk for problem gambling, and we'll get into those groups, or they are people who um, uh, may have experienced some level or uh, of problematic gambling. For example, they cannot decrease the amount of gambling, the amount that they are gambling, right? Or they may uh, spend more money than anticipated when they're gambling, right? So it may, it, these are just indicators, right? It means they're at risk. Um, we then see the category of problem gamblers, right? People who are experiencing some negative consequences. And then the final category are severe problem gamblers. Um, many times, right, these are folks who can fit into that DSM category that I just referred to. Um, for the most part, we will talk about this group, right, the problem gamblers group, right? Um, when we get into risk and protective factors, this at-risk gamblers group will be really important. For example, in the gambling space, um, youth are in this category, uh, people who experience substance misuse are in this category. Um, I just point this out because as we get into conversation, again, I just want to pay attention to the language. Like any continuum, um, folk, people can move back and forth between this continuum, right? Perfect. Um, I went through many of this. I won't kind of focusing, I won't focus on it. Um, the other thing I just want to name to make sure people know, I'm, I keep using uh, the language of gambling. I want to make sure I, everybody knows what that means. Um, here are examples of gambling. Um, just take a look. Um, I often... Sorry, my screen is delayed here. Um, 
some people are often surprised about things like bingo. Yes, bingo is still gambling. Um, there are lots of charitable categories that uh, places like church may have that. It's still gambling, right? Um, I just want to pause here. I'm wondering if there are any questions about what I've said so far. I'm not seeing any in the Q&A. And I think we've got some people making comments, sharing comments, but no, no questions. Perfect. And it sounds like there is some familiarity with gambling as well, which is exciting. And people really getting the connection between addiction, right? Addiction it's, is addiction. It, it um, is also, there is a one quick question. Would gaming like loot boxes, et cetera, be included? Yes, Alexis, thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, there's a whole new category of gambling, uh, not new, but I know I mentioned video gaming. Within video games, there are things called loot boxes, which basically is something people can purchase without knowing what's in it, right? And the hope often is I can get more X, whatever I need to play this game, right? Sometimes it's uh, kind of like bucks that you can spend in the game. Sometimes it's longer life or more weapons or whatever, whatever kind of game you're playing. But the reality is if you um, put up money and you don't know what the outcome is, it's essentially gambling, right? So yes, that, those are huge. The other kind of gambling I'll just bring attention to, it's on here, is sports betting. Sports betting is uh, rapidly increasing in this country. Um, and uh, I'll just give you a, a, an idea of how big sports gambling is. ESPN, if you go on ESPN.com, they have their own section for sports betting, right? This is big money, and this is things that youth will have access to, right? Youth at all ages, right, will have access to. So great question. Um, this is time. We have a uh, trivia question, right? Trivia question. If you flip a penny and it comes up heads four times in a row, and the next flip is more likely to come up tails than heads, True or false? I'll say this again. If you flip a penny and it comes up heads four times in a row, the next flip is more likely to come up tails than heads. True or false? I see falses, but I see some trues. I see some falses. All right. 50-50, nice, absolutely, to an extent. So I love how everybody is thinking. It's a false, right? Just like everybody is saying. Um, and for those of you who said yes, or to an extent, here's why. There's no relationship between the previous outcomes and the next flip of the penny, right? There's only two sides of the flip penny. Someone said it, it's 50-50, right? They are absolutely unrelated events. The penny is just as likely to come up heads as it is tails. Part of why I point this out, right? This is probability. Is it, you know, one of the ways or one of the risk factors to, for gambling, right? One of the ways to, to say, is this gambling to know if you're gambling is to explore probability, right? And it's actually a really good thing to protect the factor if you understand this, right? Because you know, it's not about a feeling you get. It's not about a dream, right? Some people say, oh, my, 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 my hand is scratching. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be lucky. It's not about any of those things. No superstition, right? It's about probability, right? And the numbers don't lie. The, re the reason the lottery is so popular is because there's so many people that don't know this, that don't care about the odds, that don't consider the odds, right? And the reality is with gambling, it's important for you to do that so that you can be realistic with yourself about what's actually likely to happen, right? And we know people who understand gambling is connected to odds. 
um, it's a protective factor. So they, those are often the people who say, you know what, I'm going to go to the casino or I'm going to gamble here, but I'm only taking X amount of dollars. Once that's gone, I, I, I'm done, right? It's not people who think, guess what? I feel it. It's, it's happening. I feel it. It's coming. It's not that superstition piece. So this is an important element of gambling, right? Knowing the odds. Here is one more, before I go on to that, let me just check uh, the comments, law of averages. Yeah, so I love, so Sally, I love what you're saying when you're talking about um, gambling often makes people feel good, right? And it's that dopamine, right? So we, we earlier in slides, it was right this comparison of what happens in your brain is something similar to what happens when someone engages with substances, right? And it's the dopamine. We're going to get into this a little more, but our brains have the same chemical reaction, right? And it feels good. Rebecca, uh, there yes. was a quick question too in the Q&A that says, what relationship exists between autism, ADHD spectrum, and drug gambling risk taking and addiction? Very interesting. So I cannot say for sure, but I will say in the gambling space, people with disabilities are a risk that's at our group that's at um, high risk um, for developing problems with gambling, right? And when we talk about this nexus, right, we know that these two issues often co-occur at the same time, right? This is what we're talking about today. Um, we also know, and we're gonna get into this more, we know mental health also often co, co, often co occurs with these issues. Um, so I don't necessarily know the research on specifically ADHD, but Certainly it is a category, uh, be having a disability is a, puts you at higher risk for these things. Thank you for that. Any other questions before we go on to the next question? I don't see any. All right, perfect. Um, next question, gamblers who lose large amounts of money just don't know how to gamble. Gamblers who lose large amounts of money just don't know how to gamble. True or false? Nice. Nice. I love that somebody laughed. Believe it or not, <laughs> we, we actually have uh, a quiz, like a 10 question quiz we do with folks when they're learning about uh, problem gambling and you you'd be surprised right many most folks said false or disagree you guys are actually correct and it's really the answer that i thought would be really helpful for for all of us as we're thinking through this right skill and knowledge play a small part in some types of gambling such as certain card games right but for the most part gambling is a game of chance and the gambler has very little control over the outcome, right? This underscores, right, really, what we, again, what we were saying about odds. But what I found is the language is helpful for people, right? Pointing out that skill and knowledge, right, have very little to do um, with gambling, right? Pointing those out specifically, um, you know, I mentioned ESPN earlier, and if you talk to people who are interested in sports, those may be some folks who, right, they often look at stats of players, right? They want to look at their past performance to be able to try to figure out what they're going to do in future performances, right? And the reality is it doesn't matter the, act, the gambling activity, right? If we stay firm to knowing the odds, if we're clear about skill and knowledge, just right, only plays a small part that the person who's gambling has very little chance or control over the outcome. It will put us in a really good place to look at gambling realistically, if that makes sense. 
also note that um, with substance misuse, these elements do not exist at all, right? Um, however, yeah, I think the comparison is really interesting. Uh, my background is in substance misuse prevention, among other things. And when I came into the gambling space, I had absolutely no idea. Um, I also see another question. I'll just, uh, it says, is the kids arcade claw game gambling, John? Um, so the kids arcade game, you put money in and you try to get a reward, right? You don't know for sure, right? So in our definition where the outcome is uncertain, absolutely, it is gambling. Um, we often talk about Dave and Buster's, right? Chuck E. Cheese. These are all companies created by the industry, really, to get families involved uh, in gambling, right? Um, it's also fun. Right. There are many times you can participate in these things um, again and not experience negative consequences. But it is important if we're going to talk about prevention to talk about how young people are prepared. Right. Mm -hmm. To play these games and think they're harmless. That that's that's not by accident. All right. We'll go ahead and move on if there's no other questions. Perfect. So the intersection. Let's Sorry, continue. Rebecca, one just, just came in. No worries. Of course, they always happen that way. Bill no also wants to know, has legalized gambling and the lotto increased acceptance and problems with gambling? So yes, is the short answer. Um, you know, legalized gambling, um, so I'll say a couple of things. One is cities and states are the largest beneficiaries of gambling because licensing fees, right? It's, it's really expensive for anyone to come into a city and set up a gambling shop. Um, and cities and states get those taxes and revenues, right? Um, and so because of that, right? They have, they promote, right? They, they set up systems, they support it. Uh, when casinos are built, it's it's closely connected to community development. So there's people in communities that get resources. Um, so yeah, the acceptability uh, about gambling has significantly increased in this country. When you think about the impact of COVID um, on state budgets and really the need for to, to look for dollars and look for more money and resources, um, many states have turned to sports betting. Many states have um, expanded gambling, even outside of sports gambling, right? Um, so absolutely. Um, and then there was another, can you say the question one more time? Because I think there was one more piece besides a lottery. <laughs> uh, sorry, do we lose more than we gain from legalization? That's from Bill. And Bill, did we answer the the first question fully, or the sec the your previous question? Maybe this is a rhetorical question. You know, do we lose more than we gain from legalization? So, yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, it's a good question. And so I talked about beneficiaries. Here's the other kind of consideration. In Massachusetts, we're really lucky that we have, we're really lucky in Massachusetts. Um, we have some of the largest amount of prevention dollars compared to other states, right? And the reason we do is because when gambling was expanded in the state, there were some mechanisms they um, built into the legislation that guaranteed a funding for prevention, right? And so technically speaking, right, this is similar in some ways or in the substance abuse world. 
So technically it is gambling revenues that go into a fund that fund prevention activities in Massachusetts, right? And so to your point, um, there are benefits of expanded gambling, right? I, I, you know, there certainly are, there's no question, but there are also harms. And I think we're really lucky in Massachusetts because the state acknowledges those harms, right? Says, we know there's gonna be harms from, that come from this. And it's our responsibility to set up the state in a way that can make sure people who need help get the help that they need, right? So, you know, I encourage everyone to be, have this conversation. States should have the conversation. Organizations should have the conversation, right? The cost benefit analysis. And then decide where you want to roll your sleeves up and, and begin to address the issue. But I think it's a really important question. So thank you. Rebecca, one more quick question. Larry's wondering, in those figures for sports um, gambling, does it include high school sports or is it professional sports only? <laughs> so thank you, Larry. When it first came out, that was everyone's question. So to my knowledge, it does not include high school sports, but it does include college sports, which I think is risky. Um, is risky. So, it, you know, it's a good question. Um, there are lots of people who feel like, um, you know, that because colleges and universities make so much money off the backs of college students, that college students should be allowed to not just participate in gambling, um, but they should also have access to more dollars, basically. Um, I think it's really interesting. Great question. Thank you. All right. As we move on into the intersection, keep the questions coming. We will answer them. Um, I really like how everybody's thinking about these issues, certainly thinking strategically about gambling. Um, all right, let's look at this intersection more. So co-occurrence rates are between 25 and 63%. Um, different studies say different things. Um, it's actually a really high co-occurrence rate, right? Even if it was, if we look at kind of the bottom 25, that's still pretty significant. And if you go all the way up to 63, that's very similar, right? And I think up to this point, we've seen many similarities um, in these two issues. When we look further at comorbidities, uh, problem gambling rates among those who misuse substances are four to 10 times that of the general population, right? Here is that connection that I mentioned earlier. So this, right, when we look at risk, right, we know people who have, who misuse or have a history of misusing substances are very at risk. But if they add gambling or begin to gamble, not only are they more likely to develop a problem, but they're four to 10 times more likely to develop a problem, right? Which if you think about it for people who are in recovery from substance misuse, this means they are not safe. Right. We just talked about how gambling is looked at as a normal activity, right? We know ESPN is even talking about this. So folks, so sports can potentially get uh, people who are in recovery from substance misuse, can, can potentially kind of expose them to something dangerous for them, right? Um, so this is, this is significantly high at risk. Um, I'm just looking at the chat. Um, I, uh, Sally making the connection between uh, cigarettes and how long it took her, absolutely. Um, so, so this is significant risk. Um, I have to tell you, so I've been doing work in problem gambling for about five years. And when we first started doing our community assessments, I remember this is us in prevention. 
we thought there might be a connection between problem gambling and substance misuse, but we really weren't sure. And so we started doing focus groups with people in recovery. And I have to tell you, they were like, there's definitely a connection, right? They knew immediately. So, um, you know, I think this highlights not just risk, but how unsafe people are in our communities, right? When we, we, we believe that there's lots of support currently, right? So just looking at a kind of different perspective. Um, all right. Here are some other things that contribute to this nexus between these issues. Um, let's, let's go back to kind of prevention for a second and think about how we traditionally address issues, right? Uh, within substance misuse. Um, in substance misuse and prevention, uh, when we are right, addressing underage drinking um, and we want to impact retail availability, we often go right partner with liquor stores, package stores, right? In the problem gambling space, there is potentially room to partner with lottery stores, right? Um, we always get stories and stories about how people buying lottery tickets impacts um, the community, right? And, and it's in multiple ways, right? Um, something else to kind of explore, social availability. Um, family and Fridays, right? He, we know that people get access, so young people get access to gambling through family and friends, right? We know that young people get access to alcohol and drugs from family and friends. So again, a way to address both these issues, right? Um, in a similar way. Also uh, enforcement and adjudication. So what does that look like? So we know on the substance misuse side, um, right? Young people who get caught misusing substances or participating in something illegal, there's lots of diversion courts for them, right? Well, on the problem gambling side, there's room for that. I, act, I don't remember what state, but there's actually a state that was working on um, working with the courts for young people who got caught in casinos or gambling illegally, right? Um, exploring uh, social and community norms. So we just talked about problem gambling, right? And how many people see this as um, a normal activity. The same goes, we know there's lots of stigma related efforts in substance misuse, right? I think about attitudes favorable to use, right? It's the same exact thing, right? Also uh, promotion. If we think about positive risk taking, um, this is an issue that you can address with both substance misuse and problem gambling. Um, Actually, uh, in Massachusetts, we have a problem gambling, um, a initiative focused on youth and their caregivers called Photo Voice. And we specifically focus on positive risk taking, right? Not just telling young people don't gamble, but replacing it with something, right? Acknowledging that young people will take risks already, right? And that's something that can be addressed. Um, I also think about programs who, substance misuse programs who are already addressing some of these things, right? It could be really easy to um, continue to address the same thing with a small change, right? Um, pricing, right? This low price, high demand. Right now, um, we know this is true for drugs and alcohol, right? There's lots of efforts to keep prices at a certain place um, for demand. Um, certainly, I think about underage drinking, right? Where the alcohol that's cheap gets put in a different place, like maybe behind the counter. So it's not easily accessible, right? Um, when it comes to pricing for problem gambling, um, so many, many young people get free access to gambling on phones 
uh, because you can gamble right on your phone, right? The internet, right? Low to no cost. Um, what is also true is a lot of young people have access to their parents' credit cards, right? Um, so pricing is a big deal. If someone ever wanted to address uh, how to keep prices a little bit higher so that it's out of youth reach, would, it would be really interesting, right? Um, and then low perceived risk. We talked about this earlier with the graphs uh, that we looked at. Um, in you know, increasing perception of harm is certainly something that could um, happen for both issues, right? Substance misuse and problem gambling. Um, in the photo voice pro project that I talked to about um, a little earlier, uh, this is what we do. We actually address substance misuse and problem gambling, right? Um, through, you know, and we talk about increased perception of harm. Young people are, have also identified one of the things, for example, young people identified areas in your community that are not cleaned up, right? And, and inhibit young people from playing there. You'll often on the ground see needles, you'll see smoking paraphernalia, you'll see drug paraphernalia, you'll see gambling paraphernalia, you'll see scratch tickets. Right, scratch tickets are all over the place when you talk about um, uh, littering, and it contributes to many of these things that we just talked about here, right? And makes people think it's just part of being an adult, right? An adult. Um, this, I encourage you guys to keep this uh, if you are ever interested in addressing these things. Um, it is a cheat sheet that is very, very helpful. Early on when doing this work, it was hard to identify these things. So keep this if it's ever possible. Um, the other thing I just encourage, if you have a youth group that you're already working with um, and you bring in either speakers or you talk about different topics, that's a great way to introduce problem gambling, right? Just pick a day. We're gonna talk about a new topic and then let the youth draw connections because they've been, in, in my experience, are really good at doing that. Any questions before we move on to this? We do have a question. It popped up in the chat. We've got one in Q&A. April asks, do we know what extent grocery store, it looks like California scratcher ticket machines are monitored by employees and if they intercede when they see youth accessing them? Um, do they card youth who look like they may be too young? So I don't, for Minnesota, I don't know what that is, but maybe you do. Yeah, so thank you for that. So I know you're talking about the vending machines, they're in grocery stores. Um, I know in my grocery store, once you go through the line, you pay for your food, they're often right there. And I have, in my experience in Massachusetts, they are not manned. People are not watching them. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for intervention. That's a really good point. Um, and in terms of, uh, uh, are they carding? It's a really good question, right? And this is when, right, I encourage folks to begin with a community assessment. Um, in casinos, often casinos have very good systems to make sure people are the age they're supposed to be in order to play games in the casino. But what you are talking about is there are lots of opportunities in communities for people to gamble. And you're right, right? Um, and there is not as much enforcement, at least from in my experience that I've seen in some of those um, community options, right? For example, lottery tickets. I've never seen anyone carded to get a lottery ticket. I see the signs that say you have to be X years old, but I've there's also not initiatives necessarily, you know, how we do underage drinking where you see if people can buy alcohol, if the store will allow them. That could also be really interesting for, for in the gambling space when we're thinking about prevention, right? You could get a really good handle on, are they carding? Do they care? Do they not care? Um, the other thing I would just call attention to are relationships among young people. Um, it's really important that they are taught that there's ways to have fun without actually gambling, right? 
And so explore young people's norms, right? And what they think is normal. Um, because when we did that in Massachusetts, there were all types of youth groups that were gambling together. And because nobody had talked to them, they didn't even think it was a problem, right? So thank you for that question. Really good point. Any other questions? Yes. Um, well, Bill just says, thank you for the discussion and the direction of the analysis. Uh, Marcia is asking, uh, I work with the older population. Some of these folks are treated very well in casinos until their money runs out. Yeah, yeah. And then Billy Foster says, um, to purchase a lottery ticket in Mississippi, they have to scan your driver's license to complete the purchase. Wow. So that's interesting. Very interesting. Um, and, and it's a good, right? I think, right, folks take note, if it's a problem in your state, take note, right, of where they do that. It's really smart. Um, as it uh, um, is connected to older adults, this is a population at, at, at elevated risk. Um, the, this is typically the group that casinos target or it's a group that casinos target. They often have the shuttles, right, from their, from their housing development or from their senior center, right? They have organized trips to casinos. And there are many people that use casinos for their um, interpersonal uh, development, right? That, right? It's often, I don't have anybody at home or I don't have many friends, so I go to the casino to have fun it can be risky for them, right? And to your point, if they're not being treated properly in the casino, that too is a challenge. Um, there are some, uh, they're not quite prevention programs, it's more um, intervention, but there are some intervention programs that operate inside casinos um, where there could be some opportunity to engage older folks, right? Either if they're having trouble or if they just need some support, right? So thank you. I think that's it for right now. Perfect, moving on. So continuing to look at this nexus, um, interesting things that I found in the literature I thought were interesting just to highlight. Um, some types of gambling more be, may be more likely to co-occur with substance use disorders. Um, for example, slot machines. Um, in the gambling treatment space, there's lots of knowledge around the mechanics of different types of gambling and how the mechanics impact either your brain or how people think. Um, um, if people are interested, um, you know, say so, we can make sure, I can make sure I get you information about it. Um, I think the thing to highlight here is um, if there are certain types of gambling that people are gravitating to, you just might want to take a look at that. Um, don't assume all gambling is created equal because it's not, right? We did identify certain types of gambling that may be, you know, some have more access than others. Some you need to go to certain places, others, other times you don't. Um, and then there are games of skill, right? These are those games where you may need, you may need some kind of knowledge or skill to play it. Um, so I would just, just be aware of that. Um, gender, culture, and age often impact drugs of choice, gambling participation, and substance misuse patterns. Um, it's really important to note this, right? Because um, it's going to tell you based on your community or the population that you serve, it's going to tell you what to focus on. Um, just as an example, um, so one of the populations we work with is the AAPI community. Um, and um, that's the Asian and Pacific Islander community. Um, I, I've learned a lot since being in this field about the Asian populations and things like Chinese New Year and how connected gambling is to a lot of their cultural events, right? And the groups and, you know, many of the groups that we work with are 
really doing hard work to think about how do we disrupt this thing that's been in our culture for years and years and years, right? Um, there are some cultures, uh, I have a, one of my colleagues who works with us, he's, he's from Puerto Rico and he often talks about chicken fighting, how that is cockfighting, how, how you know people are often gambling with that, how connected it is to his culture, how people use it, not just for economic gain, but it's part of the infrastructure of the country. Um, so many of these things are, it's just really important to know the population that you're addressing and the population that you're dealing with. Um, recreational gamblers and substance misuse problems. Uh, so sorry, recreational gamblers uh, with substance misuse problems started gambling at early ages um, and were more likely to gamble in hopes of winning money uh, and gambled more heavily. So, so this is a group we haven't quite talked about, but let's just think for a second. And if you hear noise in the background, my son is here, school ended last week, so bear with me. Um, so, so let's look at, so recreational gamblers, these are people, right, who gamble without consequences. So recreational gamblers with substance abuse problems, right? So this is a category we have not thought about, but they often gamble at early ages, right? So, um, and they gamble in hopes of winning money, right? So if you're gambling in hopes of winning money, it's often a risk factor because you're not thinking about the odds. You're not thinking about what's realistic, right? You're really just hoping luck is on your side, right? Um, and you see they gambled more heavily. So just know just because someone is a recreational gamble, ga uh, recreationally gambles, it does not mean that they are safe from all harm, right? It's really important that you look at these segmented populations and you're saying, okay, what is their real risk, right? So, so you know, just, just be aware. Um, the other thing is uh, um, obviously gambling at earlier ages, we know that that's a risk factor for both gambling and substance misuse. Any questions here about any of these pieces that I highlighted? Yes. Um, well, Bill's got a couple comments in the questions. Um, he mentions that many residential facilities allow buses to transport seniors to gamble, and sometimes they're allowed a limited amount of money to spend. Sometimes accessing the powers of attorney is needed. Escape and ritual is motivational. Right. Oh, and then he also says, this is a really complex and complicated multi-level and interwoven issue. Um, yeah, yeah, so many, I think, especially with these, this older adult population, people have some really strong feelings <laughs> about um, what's, you know, the concerns that we have. Absolutely. Thank you, Bill. Bill, you're absolutely right. This is complex and complicated, right? And this is why one, we're highlighting this nexus, but really encouraging people to take your time and really think about what this means for your community. Um, and that is, I mean, accessing powers of attorney, right? Which for me infers more money, right? It means the money they first went with might not been enough or the money maybe they had left was not enough. They had to access more, right? Which is a risk factor right there. Imagine if uh, people who work in these residential facilities or the people who go to the casino with these older adults, imagine if they're trained in what to look for, right? Imagine mm -hmm. they have the opportunity to do some level of intervention or get them some support. Yeah. Obasi also says, how much does the lack of social interaction and engagement contribute to older adults gambling behavior? A lot. Um, the older adults certainly that we've spoken to, they see often going to the casino or other gambling venues, they see it as entertainment, right? And you're right, they look at it like, well, I can talk to people there. 
I'm in my house. I'm not, I'm by myself. I'm lonely. Well, let me go to the casino where there's uh, more people. And let's be honest, the casino has done a really good job of making the casinos a destination, right? Because there's not just slot machines. There's not just gambling there, right? There's often uh, live shows, right? There's eating, right? Massive restaurants. Um, there's also, there's a casino here in uh, Massachusetts. There's actually a um, movie theater, right? Shared parking, shared garage parking space. Then you walk in, you see the movie theater and then there's the casino. So there's, there's lots of things to do, right? Um, so it is, it absolutely contributes. Great connection. That's it for now. Perfect. Let's move on. All right. Continuing to explore behaviors associated with comorbidities to this nexus. Um, people with substance use disorders may use gambling to support their drug habits. Um, when we were do working with, again, people in recovery from substance misuse, um, and we did focus groups. Um, we heard lots of stories about this. Um, people who didn't have money to get high on substances. And so uh, this one guy he's told the story, he had a friend, couldn't get money to get high on substances. So he would go to the dumpster and he would find scratch tickets that weren't scratched and he would scratch them. And it would hold him over until he could get drugs, right? Um, be aware of this, um, but also think about how to use this information in your prevention initiatives, right? Everyone can be involved regardless where they are in the spectrum. Gambling can be a substitute activity that may become exacerbated upon abstinence from drugs. Um, I've actually seen this happen uh, when I worked uh, close to a treatment program. Um, and this was actually somebody who was in recovery, had significant clean time, um, you know, had moved on, was in a master's program, and uh, somehow ended up gambling and developed a really significant problem with it. Um, so be aware. This is also why it's helpful to address these two issues together, because, you know, especially for high risk populations, you can keep them safe. And it's, it's kind of like a double check off for lack of a better way, word, um, because it really kind of has them check their basis. People with substance use disorders were more likely to use substances before or while gambling to enhance performance, ease the pain of losing or enhance the joy of winning. If we think about it, right, gambling and using substances often happens in the same place, right? If we think about, we know at the casino, people um, have access to free alcohol when, as long as they're gambling, right? Um, if we think about family functions, right? When alcohol comes out, what also often gambling comes out. I know in my community, right, the Black African American community, if the cards come out, the alcohol's coming out, and people, the money comes out, right? So um, just note that, right? Um, this is often why in treatment programs, substance misuse treatment programs, they are not allowed to gamble, right? So be aware of that as well. Gambling can be a reinforcer of drug use and an obstacle to success in treatment. So if gambling is not on anyone's radar and someone's in treatment, but they are gambling, that can inhibit their progress, right? Um, one of the people in recovery who became a gambling ambassador. He was doing some peer-to-peer -peer work, educating others about this nexus. And he actually came to one of our TA meetings and he said he had to, he had to you know, have a one-on-one -on -one with himself and say, what are you doing? You can't, 
can't be educating people about this nexus and buying scratch tickets, right? And he often talks about his journey to realizing this, right? Uh, people with the history of problem gambling and substance use disorder histories were more likely to have attempted suicide at some point in their lives. Yet another public health issue that puts people at risk, right? Especially this nexus, people who are impacted by this nexus, right? Um, separately, if we took these issues, problem gambling, substance use, substance misuse, suicide is co-occurs with both of these. So when we put this nexus together, that level of risk significantly increases. Um, and then finally, poly substance users were more likely to exhibit serious problem gambling than those with only one substance addiction, right? Um, again, elevating risk, right? Elevating risk. Uh, we also know poly substance users are at elevated risk for a whole range of other things as well, right? Any questions about this before I move on? We've got a couple questions. Um, someone said, I heard that social media is made to work similar to a slot machine. So is that, have you heard that in this work? Um, not necessarily social media, um, but not necessarily social media. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know the kind of technology behind that. Um, they certainly work in concert together. So for example, um, and I'm going to say this, if you're at risk or um, if you're at risk, just I, I would not do this if it would put, it, put you at risk. But when I was looking kind of early on trying to understand this, so if you Google Blackjack, just as an example, and you go on a Blackjack site, you will get lots of pop-ups about other opportunities. I mean, and it's quick. It's like this. So, right, the... For me, it seems like it mirrors what happens on social media, how you can look up one topic and all of a sudden you have all these other opportunities to explore that topic in other ways, groups and conversations and all these other things. So it could be connected. It seems like they use some similar technology, but I'm not sure. Good question though. Yeah, we have a question. Is the history of trauma a significant risk factor for gambling issues? Great question. So I have not, so one, I would dive in the literature. Um, there's a lot about gambling that we're learning. Um, I do know that, right, we know trauma is certainly connected to substance use, right, the development of substance use disorders. Um, and because mental health is, um, co-occurs with problem gambling, I would not be surprised if it's connected. Um, but I would need to jump into the literature for specific connections. Um, just as an example, um, the Photo Voice Project in Massachusetts um, that we work with young people and engage them in, in um, problem gambling prevention, I can't tell you how many times young people have been talking about issues um, related to gambling, related to their community, related to substance misuse, and trauma has come up incredibly yeah. often. So, so I would not be surprised. Um, I'm looking at our time and how much more you have left to present, and we're we're down to about 12 minutes or so. Okay. And I want to just I'm going to hold off questions at this point and let you get through the material. Perfect. Thank you for this. So we just talked about mental health indicators, right? Um, they certainly are connected to this nexus, right? And, and we can imagine lots of ways to explore that. Um, I'm gonna just move on because of time. Just to highlight uh, this nexus, some things that are uh, different versus the same about both substance misuse and problem gambling. Differences is that gambling is known as the hidden addiction. If, you know, if someone scratches scratch tickets, you have no idea that, and they come into your house, you have no idea they did that. Whereas there are usually some smell or look 
or kind of indicators you can see with substance misuse. Um, you cannot overdose on gambling, right? It's often where suicide comes in because people can't, there's just a compulsion to keep going, keep going, and people cannot handle it after a while. Um, there's no test for problem gambling. So this is why it's so important for people to, to speak up and say, hey, I'm struggling. Um, because there's no other way. And then there are fewer resources for gambling than there are substance misuse, right? We've, we've talked about this the entire kind of webinar here. Um, similarities, you can see them here. I'll just call out a few. There's both legal and illegal forms for both of these issues we've been talking about. It's, a, you know, I encourage you guys to explore both of them. We talked about how both are regulated and promoted by the state, um, can produce negative consequences, right? How culture can influence the use of both. And then the following issues we talk about often, right? Tolerance, stigma, lack of services, and recovery is possible, right? The most important thing to remember. Here is the continuum of care. Um, it is very similar for both issues, both problem gambling and substance misuse, right? So there is opportunities to get involved. The one kind of plea I would say here is because there are not many people who know about gambling, right? And problem gambling, get treatment and folks in recovery involved in prevention efforts, right? Um, the, the, we're early on and there's lots of opportunities to um, address this and prevent it really. Shared risk and protective factors. Um, we have seen the kind of uh, multiple layers of risk for various populations. And so let's not forget about, really we wanna make sure everybody is served, right? And gets the resources they want. And if we want to do that, um, accurately, it's important that we focus on health equity, right? Those populations that are marginalized or who are historically left out. And if we want to really achieve or address health equity, we can't just address these issues in isolation. It's important that we um, improve access to conditions and resources that influence health, right? And here are some examples of that. Um, it's very possible to do both. Um, and if we want, and a lot of that can happen through environmental strategies, right? There's that prevention science that we want to continue to uplift. Um, gamblers who seek treatment are generally white, middle-aged, while gamblers identified in the general population are likely to be women, minorities, and people with lower education. What are the implications of this? Because of time, I won't go in, I won't kind of have you guys sign, chime in, but if we think for a second that the people in treatment are generally white and middle-aged men, while women, minorities, and people who have lower education are found in the communities. Often what that means is women, minorities, and people with lower education are often not connected to treatment, and yet they have problems with gambling. And so, part, right, that means that Efforts to connect them to treatment need to be strengthened, um, but also prevention efforts, right? Um, I mentioned in Massachusetts, um, we have resources, so we're kind of ahead of the game with prevention, at least we've gotten started. I strongly encourage folks to look at prevention when, it, when, when we think about this. Explore, identify these populations in your community. Start having conversations about gambling and the impact that it has on them. If there are treatment programs, have conversations with them. Who, who are you reaching and who are you not reaching, right? All of this will push equity forward um, and, make, and make it so that more people have access to help. The social ecological model, we know that this model is essential to prevention, right? And um, it's, central, it's essential to making sure that we can address various levels of our world, right? Um, we can also use this to explore risk factors, right? And see how to protect these various levels from experiencing negative consequences. Um, here are some shared risk factors for this nexus. Um, 
I encourage you guys to take a look. Um, if you are addressing any of these uh, risk factors for uh, substance misuse prevention, you can also address them for problem gambling, right? Um, this is how we can be efficient as well as make sure what we do aligns with research. Because this is a quote unquote new topic, problem gambling, um, let's try to address this with efficacy, right? Um, here are some shared risk factors for youth. Um, someone asked about trauma and here it is, right? Um, again, if you're, if you're working with young people and you're already addressing some of these or you want to, this is a great way to address both issues, right? Great way to address both issues. Um, youth risk factors. Uh, here are individual level risk factors. If we look at this, these risk factors, it, it should be no surprise, right? Because if we think about it, we know with young people, the young people who are in trouble are often the young people who have, right? The ones who are impacted by substance misuse, they're impacted by gambling and mental health and a whole range of other things, right? We look at interpersonal domain. Here are some risk factors for family and friends, right? Very interpersonally related if you, if you look at it, right? Lack of knowledge, right? Peers who gamble, right? Family history, here are the same risk factors for the community. I won't highlight these because of the because we don't have much time, but these are things if you're already employing some of these strategies, figure out how to mind, you know, tweak them in a minor way and you can address this other issue as well. Um All right, protective factors. So these are also no surprise, right? The protect the factors that protect young people against substance misuse are the factors that protect young people from problem gambling, right? Lots and lots of synergy here. Um, and it gives us, it's, it's, it's actually helpful for us, right? Implications for prevention and intervention, right? When, I guess this is the reminder, right? That um when addressing a new issue or an issue that is emerging right that there's a continuum of evidence right some have more evidence others have less evidence right and we want to as best as we can we want to pick up those th those elements that have evidence right um and we want to apply that to what is new, essentially, right? We also want to make sure that we have uh, evaluations when possible, right? Here are some recommendations to consider, right? Because there is some evidence that is lacking, particularly on the problem gambling side. Um, and we've been talking about this the entire time apply lessons learned preventing other behavioral health problems, right? I think we called attention to this earlier, right? Alcohol availability is connected to underage drinking, like gambling availability is connected to underage gambling, right? Another recommendation, select promising strategies that make theoretical and practical sense, right? This is a uh, communications campaign from Massachusetts, um, right? Drugs, alcohol, gambling, different stories, same problem, right? Applying those same strategies that I would, that we would otherwise in substance misuse to here and make the connection for people, right? This is one of the good things about highlighting this nexus. People don't have to guess, make the connection right away. Finally, evaluate, 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 as I just mentioned, uh, document both the story of your intervention. What did you do? What worked? What didn't work? What components did you add? What did you omit? Why? And what were your expected outcomes? If you don't have dollars for an evaluator, if you document these pieces, you can give that later on to an evaluator to, to evaluate your work. Very helpful. Um, 
The other thing you want to do is you want to stay on message. There are some things that we know about substance misuse that we want to really pull through here, right? We want to remember the levels of prevention, right? Um, you want to be clear about your goal when identifying your level, right? Again, as I mentioned, you know, in, in the problem gambling space, youth, right, are really secondary prevention, right? Whereas maybe substance misuse efforts, they're primary prevention. So you really want to focus, uh, right? Remember these levels of prevention and act accordingly. You also want to focus on your population, right? Universal, selective, and indicated, right? Uh, interventions that target the general population, we know are universal pop strat, uh, interventions. An example, youth development programs, right? Those are programs that address any issue, right? They just wanna make sure youth are healthy. This is a great place to address this nexus. We mentioned the media campaign already. Selective in interventions. Examples are interventions for children who um, have parents who have a gambling disorder, right? Another example, as I mentioned, interventions for youth who are actively gambling, right? That puts them at risk. Um, and then finally, indicated interventions. An example of this are interventions for people in recovery from substance misuse. We've been talking about this the entire time as well. So just be aware, you, you know, it's really important to figure out where in this nexus you're targeting and um, what your goals are, right? Finally, uh, we want to adhere to what we know, right? SAMHSA's six prevention strategies. Let's not recreate the wheel for this, right? Um, this can be, right, information dissemination, giving out information about problem gambling at your substance misuse um, events, right? Um, or vice versa. The organizations who are funded for gambling give out substance misuse prevention information at their events. Um, and you could do the same with uh, education, right? For example, this webinar is a great example about this nexus, right? Um, alternative activities, regardless of the topic, we know young people need safe, healthy activities to participate in, just as an example, right? So don't recreate the will, go here because we know evidence lives here and then build on that. And then uh, here are some examples. I think I'm, I mentioned them, right? Program, substance misuse programs, including gambling prevention elements and vice versa. Um, innovate by applying lessons learned from other behavioral health programs. This, right, the violence prevention, the suicide, as well as other issues, lots of you guys uh, mentioned in the chat. Um, perfect. So challenges and opportunities to collaborate. Um, here are some barriers to collaboration. Um, there's often different funding sources that tell you, no, you could only address this issue with this population, right? If you have other funding that can kind of either um, cushion or be a stopgap between these funding, it's, this funding, it's really helpful. It's also helpful if you find populations that are interested in another issue, right? You can potentially still use that funding and include education about this other issue. There's a lack of problem gambling funding, um, you know, across the country right now. There are efforts at the national level to, to change that, but it's really hard when you don't have funding to do the work, right? Even if you want to. There's a lack of prevention research slash EBPs in the pre gambling prevention world, right? Right now we are doing the best we can, right? looking at evidence and trying to kind of piece this together, but there are some gaps and it's important to know that. And then finally, lack of knowledge about this nexus. Um, collaboration strategies. So build awareness about this nexus. Um, I really encourage everyone here after this webinar, go tell one person about it, 
right? Um, ensure you're adding underage gambling questions to community surveys. Um, really, really important because this will give us local data about what is happening in local communities. And we just don't have that right now. Even in Massachusetts, we only have state level data. We do not have local level data. Um, develop uniform prevention messaging. So multiple issues can be addressed at once. This is so important. And this is what can help you, especially if you're not funded to address a particular issue. If you stay on message, you can really protect the young people in your community. Um, moving on, uh, build program and organizational capacity to address this nexus. Um, we just identified a couple things in this webinar about problem gambling. There's lots more to know. And so it's really important to educate yourself, educate your organization and think about what you need in order to be able to address the issue. Um, I won't highlight others because of time, but I strongly encourage you guys to take a look at this and figure out how you can partner. We know a lot of this comes from partnership. Um, let's see. All right, we got to the end. Questions, do we wanna do questions or not? Rebecca. You know, Rebecca, we're gonna to have to unfortunately close out now because the time is at the end. Um, so I just wanna thank you so much for all the amazing information and really important information that you shared today. Um, I do have a few last slides. If anybody, if I know folks were at the half hour mark, the end mark, but if you can hang on for just a couple minutes, I'm gonna share a couple of upcoming trainings. I encourage you also to follow and like our Facebook page. I did um, include a post as we were, as Rebecca was going through today, I put a post on there for people to be able to add additional resources that you identify on this issue. I know Ruth, you put in a few uh, great articles. I was wondering if you might be willing to post those there. I posted the one that the Oregon folks um, put on the, in the chat so you can get that there. So I encourage folks to use this as a place to um, share more information about the topic. Um, upcoming trainings, we do have a virtual substance abuse prevention skills training coming up in September. We also have one in July, but it's full. So if you're wanting to attend that, um, I encourage you to apply as soon as possible. The next uh, webinar in our Nexus series will be on July 28th, and that's the Nexus with mental health promotion. We have an older adults um, webinar coming up on July 27th, and one specific to girls and women uh, substance misuse trends and prevention strategies at the end of August. So I encourage you to register for those. Um, before you uh, leave and move on to something else, we greatly appreciate if you could give us some feedback through the just a couple of questions that you will be linked over automatically to at the end of this as the webinar is closed out. So. I know we're over time, but thank you again, everybody for all of your active participation. And again, Rebecca, thank you so much for pulling together such an amazing webinar. Really appreciate it. Take care everyone, have a great day.